chapter three, and in this chapter, we will meet John the Baptist. <laughs> and uh, he ate grasshoppers, and we're going to find out what the grasshopper tastes like. And, um, but we're also going to find out why Jesus insisted on getting baptized by John. Jesus is perfect. He doesn't need to be baptized. What's the go there? <laughs> so uh, we'll do all of that and we'll pray. But first, let us read. In those days, John the baptizer came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make the way of the Lord ready, make his paths straight. Now, John himself wore clothing made of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Then people came from Jerusalem, all of Judea, and all the region around the Jordan, and went to him. They were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming for his baptism, he said to them, You offspring of vipers, who warn you to flee from the wrath to come? Produce fruit worthy of repentance. Don't think ye to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. I tell you, God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe lies at the root of the tree. Therefore every tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you in water for repentance, but he who comes after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn up with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. But John would have hindered him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. But Jesus answered him and said, Allow it now, for it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. Jesus, when he was baptized, went up directly from the water, and behold, the heavens opened to him. He saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and coming on him. And behold, a voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. <laughs> All right, so we meet John the Baptist, and we have a connection straight from here back to the last verses of the Old Testament. The last verses of Malachi chapter 4 and chapter 3. Both chapter 3 and 4 talked about this Elijah character who was to come. And he's going to, you know, he's going to turn the hearts of people to the Father. And um, now we meet John the Baptist. It's him. He's the Elijah figure. Now, you wouldn't automatically realize that, except that later on in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says that John was the Elijah who was going to come. So Jesus tells us later on that John, John the Baptist was the Elijah. <laughs> so we know that Malachi is talking about this Elijah character that's coming right at the end of the Old Testament. And here we are right at the beginning of the New Testament. And here he is. So you could think that sometimes these prophecies in the Old Testament are going to be fulfilled at the end of the world or like so far into the future. But it's literally the very next thing God does. And a lot of those prophecies are actually like that. We talked about that when we went through them, how many of them are already have been either already fulfilled or they're about gospel times. They're about Christian life right now. So John the Baptist is there and he's crying out in the wilderness, telling people to get ready for the Lord. In other words, how to re-explain his message in a way that you would understand. Um, it'd be like... A person appearing in the world today and going all through Israel talking to Jewish people and saying your Messiah is about to come let's get ready I God has told me the Messiah is about to come let's get ready so if Jewish people believed him and he was baptized if bapt baptism was part of the way of getting ready that's what he was doing well that's this is what happened 2,000 years ago John the Baptist is saying the Lord is about, in other words, the kingdom is about to be here. 
the Messiah is about to be here, get ready. And so people were getting ready. They were being baptized. They were excited. Now, Pharisees and Sadducees were like, hmm, I'm not sure this Messiah is going to come. (laughs) They didn't get baptized, and John the Baptist got cranky at them. He said, you know, produce fruit. Um, You know, the axe is at the root of the tree. In other words, this tree is about to be chopped down. Now, what's the tree? The The tree was... The tree was actually Second Temple Judaism. It was Mosaic Judaism. It was the temple and it was the worship. All of that had a purpose, but the Lord was bringing it to an end. That tree had not produced fruit. And Jesus, in all these parables that he'll tell in the, later on in this book, he'll point out that this f- tree was fruitless and it was going to be chopped down. But right at the beginning of the gospel, John the Baptist says it. He says, the axe is already at the root of the tree. It's just a short amount of time now. And the old way that Judaism was is gone. There's going to be a new thing. And of course, it's the kingdom of God and the Messiah. The Messiah, the king is here. The kingdom is here. We won't need the temple anymore. The Lord is the temple. We won't need a high priest anymore. The Lord's the high priest. We won't need sacrifices anymore. Jesus is going to die on the cross. So, yeah, the axe was at the root of that old tree because it's being chopped down. That old thing's gone. The kingdom is here. And John the Baptist came to get the people ready. (laughs) So uh, John the Baptist is a great character. Now, it says he ate um, grasshoppers, locusts and wild honey. Have you ever wondered what they taste like? I have not tried them. (laughs) I looked it up. It says here, it said that uh, in Google, it said that eating a uncooked grasshopper was like, had a mushroomy, earthy taste and it was chewy. It said eating a cooked, fried grasshopper was like a crispy prawn. <laughs> so there you go. That's not so bad. Um, a little bit later on WebM- WebMD.com, it said the practice of eating insects is known as entomophagy. I think, don't know if I said that right. Insects are eaten in countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America. A survey of markets in Bangkok, Thailand found 164 different insects being sold as food. Insects produce less greenhouse gases. They need a lot less feed than other animals. They're easier to rear. They are low tech, a low capital, low tech industry. They provide um, opportunities to poor people. So anyway, there are lots of benefits to eating bugs. <laughs> But having said all that, I am not lining up to get started. And so, <laughs> John the Baptist comes baptizing. That's a part of getting people ready for the kingdom of God and ready for the Messiah. And then Jesus comes along. And Jesus comes along and John the Baptist says, One is coming after me who is greater than me. That's Jesus. Jesus comes and wants to be baptized. And John says, I can't baptize you you're greater than me. (laughs) You should baptize me. And Jesus says, it's it's fitting to fulfill all righteousness if you baptize me. So Jesus goes into the water and is baptized by John, even though Jesus is the greater person. Now, why? Why is that fitting? Why in God's mind is that important? Well, what my father always says about this John Alley, he always says that Jesus submitted to someone who was before him and over him in the Lord. So Jesus might have been greater, but John was over him in the Lord, so to speak. It's a little bit like um, Jesus growing up in the home of Joseph and Mary. Jesus is greater than Joseph and Mary, but they're his parents. So he honors his father and his mother. Like when he's in the temple as a 12-year-old, you know, that story we haven't, we haven't encountered. But when he's in the temple as a 12-year-old, um, he's teaching the most amazing things to people much older than him. But his mum and dad say, come home. And he goes home. He honors them. So he's greater than them, but they are over him. So he's in submission. And that's a really important point. So the point we learn from Jesus is that even though he's a great person, he walks a life of submission. So churches are full of people who think, I'm an important person. 
I know better than the pastor, or I know better than so-and-so, or I know better than my life group leader, or someone's in the band, I know better than the worship leader, and they don't. Because they think they know best, they won't do what they're told. But that's not the example of Jesus. Jesus is someone who submits to those who are over him, even the Lord, over, over him in the Lord, even though he is the greater person. And that is fitting to fulfill righteousness. And it also fulfills Old Testament types. When we were going through the book of Leviticus, there was a whole chapter on the ordination of the high priest. And part of that was that Aaron had to be washed or baptized. And all the things that Aaron does are all symbols of all the things that Jesus does. So Jesus also fulfills Old Testament types. You can go back and watch my Leviticus videos. And so it's fitting. And so Jesus... Jesus later tells us to be baptized. And so when we become baptized as followers of Jesus, we are actually copying his example. So he's not telling us to do something he hasn't done. He has submitted. He wants us to submit. And he's, he's done the same thing he's asking us to do. He doesn't ask us to lay down our lives. He went to the cross and laid down his life first. He doesn't ask us to be baptized without him also being baptized we are copying our Lord Jesus Christ in every way. Now, there's a, a big discussion. I'll finish with this thought and then a prayer. There's a big discussion in the world of Christian doctrines and theology about what exactly is a sacrament. And um, the Catholics have got seven sacraments. And they're, they're all, you know, as far as I can tell, seems like good things, like, you know, marriage. They call marriage a sacrament. Well, that's a good thing. Um, Baptist churches traditionally have two sacraments, which are baptism and communion. Some churches, like the Salvation Army, don't have any. It's not they don't believe in those things. They just, the way the church got started, they never kind of really had the sacraments. They were more like an evangelistic society not than a church in the beginning, and it just kind of like stayed like that. And, um, but I'll tell you why I think there are only two sacraments, but at the same time, fully appreciating and in and with full regard for those other things that are done like you know holy orders and the, the other the other things that are called sacraments by other believers the sacraments of baptism and communion are both things that jesus told us to do and things he did himself they're things we're commanded to do by the lord but they're also things that the lord himself participated in so we follow his example but some of the other sacraments are not things that the Lord did and they're not things that the Lord told us to do. So the Lord didn't get married and he never told us to get married. He said that it's better that a man not be alone, so God made him a, a suitable helper. He said that, but he never said you have to get married. So it wasn't commanded and Jesus himself didn't get married, so we're not following his example. And so some of the other sacraments are not things commanded by Christ, but baptism and communion are. And when we do them, grace flows to us. If you haven't been baptized, then you're, you have failed to obey the Lord. The Lord Jesus has said that we are to make disciples and baptize them. That's his command. And so if you're his disciple, you need to go ahead and be baptized. And when you do, the blessings of this chapter will be added to you. And we'll finish with this thought. As Jesus comes up out of the water, it says that the, the heavens are opened. That's a blessing, open heaven. It says that the Holy Spirit came on him. That's a blessing. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the voice of heaven said, this is my son. With him I am pleased. And when you're baptized, you are included in Christ and he is pleased <laughs> it's pretty cool if you ask me let me pray for you father thank you for matthew chapter 3 and lord i thank you we've been included in christ now i pray that the grace of these things would make sense uh, to everyone who's listening lord your power be added to them and lord and if they haven't been baptized lord guide them in that way and bring them into you i pray in jesus name amen